Welcome, everyone. My name is Eric Beatner, and joining me today to talk about the new anthology Jacked is Anne Louise Bannon, Matt Witten, and Andrew Miller. We are all included in this new anthology from Run Amok Books. Welcome to you guys. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, this one is hot off the presses. It's only been out uh, about a week or so, and uh, I'm proud not only to be in this table of contents with you, but uh, all of the great authors that are included in this. Uh, and we are all, the, we're the West Coast contingent and really the, the Los Angeles contingent of this book. We're all uh, living what in other parts of the U.S. would seem like they're close to each other, but uh, we got a couple of West Siders, a couple of East Siders, uh, and for people in L.A., you might as well be in a different state. <laughs> so, so it's good to see all you guys. It's good to hang out. Matt, I know, I know we have met before. Uh, you've come and read for me at Noir at the Bar, and we know each other. We just don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, it's it's nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. and he's a neighbor, damn it. <laughs> yeah, so you you guys are close. You guys should hang yeah. out. Matt and I are on the west side. We should hang out more yeah. as long as we're not running the risk of getting infected with monkeypox these days, whatever the <laughs> pandemic du jour is. Uh, but this is an interesting way to to get to know someone it, through the works like this. And so, you know, even the, those of you that I don't know, and, and a lot of the writers in, in this book, I was not aware of them or their work before. Uh, but it's it's an interesting way to, to get to know someone because you're seeing the darkest side of them. Is that uh, for you guys, maybe not the, the side that you want to put forward first when you're meeting someone? <laughs> I don't know. I never thought about it, but uh, that is kind of a funny thought. We're definitely, you're right. We're showing our dark sides first. So I guess it's all uphill from here or downhill. So good. I, I, I have no idea. I didn't know I had a dark side. <laughs> We're not going there. <laughs> I had a novella in January called uh, LA Stories. And the guy that wrote the foreword, Rex Weiner, he mentioned uh, me and the other two guys. It's a three-part anthology. He said, uh, despite their writing, they're actually very nice people. <laughs> well, yeah. that's the way. One of the, the nicest writers. people I've ever met was Dean Coots. And you want to talk <laughs> dark. Crime writers are the nicest people. And, and I mean, I've done TV writing also, and I, I've just, and playwriting in other forms. And, but I feel that, that crime writers, for some reason, we don't seem very competitive with each other, which is very different from TV writing. It's just, we all seem to have this attitude of, you know, you're doing well, great. I'm doing well, great. And it's, um, I don't know, I've noticed people are very generous. You know, when I ask people for blurbs, they're very happy to give them. When people ask me for blurbs, I try to uh, pay it forward myself. And just in other kinds of ways, we just seem to be good. So I actually have noticed a phenomenon of crime writers being quite nice. Absolutely. Yeah. It's and any, anytime they gather in, in large groups at a conference or something, it's it, I think everyone is comes away stunned at just that thing you're describing of, you know, because the conversation can shift from, you know, hey, how are your kids? Uh, how's the dog? Oh, look, I got a new puppy to, oh, did you go to that seminar about, uh, you know, cleaning a crime scene and how to dispose <laughs> of a body properly? <laughs> That's yeah, my, my husband regularly laughs about that. He, he literally tells people, yeah, she kills people for a living. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk uh, about the theme of this collection, Jacked. Now, I, I know when I saw that as a prompt and we were allowed to interpret that word with wherever our imaginations took it. I know for me it was it was a pretty quick jump to stealing a car. I was like, oh, you, you're gonna you're gonna jack a car off the, off the street. I, for whatever reason, that came to me immediately, and and I stuck with it. But when when you think about it, I mean, I, this term has been repurposed for so many different things, so many interpretations. So I want to know, you know, th what the meaning of jacked th that you settled on, and was it a short leap like I had, or did you really have to puzzle it out a little bit? Let's uh, start with Anne. Oh dear, you're gonna hate me, Eric. <laughs> I didn't really think about it. <laughs> well, the thing that was is, um, okay, I'm in Las Vegas last November. I'd heard about the anthology, wanted to write something a little harder edged and came up with the concept of the story, uh, which is actually a spinoff of one of my other series that I've been putting on my blogs and everything. The problem is the series is 
cozy. I wrote a cozy spy novel. Who does that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually kind of a romance with espionage intrusions, but there were, it's all set in the 80s. And there are a lot of kids in this damn thing. Well, I thought, well, what would happen if we talk to the kids after they became adults and so nick flaherty who is one of the kids in the series comes in he is more cynical shall we <laughs> say and uh so that's kind of i just i'm in las vegas we're having a vacation i'm eating way too many carbs and just next thing i know i've got this damn story <laughs> Hey, whatever way works, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm good with it. It works. I mean, right. hell Andrew, I'm cheap. Yeah, Andrew, where did you land uh, on your definition of jacked? Well, I had the story before I was familiar with the prompt. So, okay. Whoa, somebody's sound fell out there. You went quiet on us. But yeah, we, we can't hear you, Andrew. He's not muted. But we want to. Oh, no, just... I don't want to mute him. I want to hear no, him. No, no, no. He's. We want to hear him. Now he's frozen. He's froze, I think. Oh, oh no, he's now back. you're back. Oh, I'm back. Okay, sorry. I had some kind of issue earlier. I thought I had fixed it, but um, um, don't yeah, touch so... anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I had the story. The story is one that takes place in uh, L.A. in the early '80s, and it was basically I had written something else set in that same period, and. I wanted to do something like that again. And it's a it's a Japanese American robbery homicide detective in LA who has some interactions with some older Japanese American detectives and kind of learns about samurai culture in hopefully pretty unexpected ways. And when I saw the prompt, you know, samurais train, samurais meditate, they study, they try to be the best that they can be. And that was sort of a different way of saying that they try to get jacked and it just sort of made sense to me to send it and i didn't know what would happen but uh burn really liked it so that was that was pretty much it excellent yeah all right matt well, how about you um yeah i was kind of like ann in the sense that i didn't really uh think about jack and i didn't actually maybe i misread the thing i didn't understand that was a prompt <laughs> my my understanding of the short story collection was that uh these guys uh, run amok books just wanted the best stories and yeah. they wanted to do something without a theme, without anything. They just wanted the best crime stories they could find. And so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I wanted to write the best crime story that I could. And uh, I picked uh, mine because I'm interested in uh, influencers on TikTok and on um, Instagram and other platforms. So I thought that was an interesting thing to write about. And um I also wanted to try to take on the challenge of writing a short story from five different characters' point of view. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Which uh, is hard enough to do in a novel. But for some reason, I just decided I would just try to do it, see how it worked. I have great respect for writers that within you know, one line, one line of dialogue or one line, you, you really get a sense of that character. That's them. It couldn't be anybody else. And so I wanted to uh, try to achieve that in this short story format and, and have the five different characters. So, um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I like the idea of a collection that is just, you know, the best short stories you can, you can find. So you, you guys are telling me that I took this thing way too seriously. Is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Eric, but that's okay. We still love you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it, we've alluded to it a little bit, but uh, we have a group of writers uh, here with a very diverse and eclectic uh, list of accomplishments from screenwriting to journalism, novels, plays, everything in between. Uh, but I, I, we're all fans of the short story form. I mean, this is something that, that's not, it's not new to us. I, I, I'm constantly running into writers who are either intimidated or, or just, you know, frightened off of the short story because they think, oh no, I couldn't be that succinct or, or it's just not in their wheelhouse. But is short story writing something that you really relish and, and love to take an opportunity to, to when you have a, a chance like this to submit, you say, yep, I'm gonna sit down and knock this out or it's not intimidating for you guys, right? I love it. It's like uh, when people say to me, it's like you 
gave a whole movie in a short story that's like that's my goal like I just I just want it to be really packed with a lot of character and plot and under 5,000 words so when I hear that it's just like that's that's what I set out to do I wouldn't say I was intimidated by it I I guess the thing that gets me is you know, writing short story, you know, for me was a great palate cleanser. I had just finished a novel and was trying to figure out my next thing. I said, oh, you know, I'll take a couple of weeks and let's uh, see what I can do here. So that was really fun. The only thing I would say is intimidating is when you have like a lot of things that you're trying to do, you, you know, write, you know, write a TV thing, market a novel, and then write another novel. And then on top of that to do a short story. So that's kind of intimidating, the thought of just taking the two weeks to do it. But but if you're, in a, if you're in a place, or for me, when I'm in a place where I really could use just a fun thing to do for a couple of weeks, not high stress, you know, not high, um, you know, whatever, just do it, have fun. Then I think a short story is just a really nice thing to do, like for, for a couple of weeks. Yeah, I agree. That's uh, the palate cleansing notion of that. I, I, I use short stories for that a lot. I think it's a great way to defeat any kind of writer's block too, because you can you know, use that mantra of write your way out of it, but doing it in a different story with different characters and it sort of hits the reset button and you can get back to a novel length work with kind of fresh eyes, I think. Yeah, and I, truth be told, I not been a short story person for a lot, a lot of years. And then uh, suddenly found myself doing a origin story for another anthology sorry <laughs> and uh, uh realized you know i do have you know i can possibly do this and so it was kind of fun and then again because this came out of this other series that i've been working with since the actual 1980s um it it made sense to me to do these as short episodes because Again, I didn't want to bring the main characters from the original series in, but because of the nature of who they are, they're spies, all their relatives would, you know, if something, you know, body pops up, the first thing they're going to do is call Uncle Sid and Aunt Lisa. So it had to be short episodes. And um, the other thing that was weird about it was all this was coming together in the middle of the pandemic. And so when I wrote Darby O'Malley and The Body in the Vineyard, which has not been accepted, it's under consideration someplace else, that just made sense to me. It just, it happened. And then, you know, again, I'm in Vegas. What the hell? What do you do? You know, <laughs> I ended up writing uh, Nick Flaherty and The Body in the Lab, which, by the way, takes place probably at Caltech, but we're not saying. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, I, I'm sure uh, sitting in your hotel room and writing a story probably saved you a lot of money in Vegas from uh, the alternatives. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> we did find a dollar blackjack table, though, so I'm oh. happy about that. There you go. That's about 20 <laughs> minutes of entertainment for me, and then I'm flat broke. Yeah, it's about the same for me, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, always good if, if you have a story to tell you know, to know what's the best place for it. Oh, would this be best as a short story? Oh, it would be best as a novel. Oh, is it a TV series? Oh, is it a movie or stage play? Mm -hmm. You know, just, uh, just to think what the right form is for it. And I think sometimes, you know, short story is the best form for it. So if it's a story that you really care about and you're passionate about, then yeah, I mean, definitely write the short story. And, and, and the stories do tend to present themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys do this, but I mean, for me, it's like, okay, this is that voice talking and they're talking in this particular way. I tend to be very audio as a writer, but it's, it's who's talking at me and what are they trying to say? And more often than not, that comes out as a novel. But in this particular case, the second generation stories are coming out of short stories, so. Yeah, and I think for, for those of us, uh, you know, with, with screenwriting background, I think the tendency to, like you were saying, Andrew, you know, keep it tight, keep it concise, mm -hmm. you know, that the cinematic yeah. is always the thing that people say, like, I'll write a, a full novel that to me feels like it's like, oh, this is a fully fleshed world. People are like, oh, this is, it really moves. It's, it's really short. And I'm like, it's, you know, 65,000 words is now considered <laughs> like almost a novella. So, you know, when you can get in there and, you know, like you say, knock it out in under 5,000 words and, and tell 
a full story that's uh, it's it's pretty satisfying i think for the writer and for the reader because they get they get the full package in a short delivery yeah i mean for me another element of it is i kind of it's always got to be personal but it's always got to be something that i don't know about and sort of want to explore so usually every short story i could i you guys said two weeks it's more like two to three months for me to write a short story I wish I could write that fast. Um, but I read usually at least three books about whatever subject it is. I've always wow. kind of been interested in Japanese history. And it was sort of like the period that I wrote this thing, which was last fall, that was sort of the period that I was going to be living in this Japanese sort of fantasy in my head as I was researching it. And so it's also just a way for me to learn something too like I can you know expand the knowledge that I have to that world as I'm writing it and that's another thing about it for me too that I really enjoy the form well all right I think it's time that uh, we give the folks a little taste uh, of some of these stories so uh and I'm gonna start with you um and as, as you said I mean this is it's a, a spin-off in in the world of your Operation Quickline series but uh mm -hmm. We're, let's get a little taste of uh, the grown-up Nick Flaherty and the body at the lab. All right. Nick Flaherty and the body of the lab. Body in the lab, excuse me. With Pasadena cops swarming the lab at the small university, it was not a good time for my wife to be calling, but then she couldn't have known that. The uniform officer about to question me looked up. If you want to take that, go ahead, he said. He was short and stocky with dark, dark hair and eyes and nameplate that read Caribbean. Of course he wanted me to take the call. Once my phone was unlocked, he'd be able to search it. If it remained locked, he'd need a search warrant. I was about to decline, but then Caribbean got called over to just outside the lab. He hurried off with a light cough. Well, our face masks weren't going to cover up the acrid stench in the room. Hey, sweetheart, I said after swiping the call on. Can't really talk. I think I'm about to get arrested. Oh, Brianna sighed. Do I need to call our lawyer? It should be fine. Okay, I'll hold dinner. Thanks. I'll uh, try to call before I leave Pasadena. Good luck, my darling. I'll see you when I see you. Can't wait, love. I swiped off the line and sighed myself. If Brianna didn't seem terribly concerned about my situation, it was only because it was not the first time something weird like this had happened. If anything, it was the 500 bazillionth time it had happened. It's kind of how my life goes. I mean, getting arrested is pretty unusual, but it's only one of many, many options on the what the fuck now spectrum. I'm also blessed that Brianna is exceptionally chill about it all and always has been. There you have it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, so, Nick, when, when you were coming up with the idea of, of Nick grown up, I mean, how much did you have to try to envision his life between where he leaves off in your series and now? Did, did, did you worry about, oh, I need, I, I need to know where his whole backstory is, or well, were you able to just drop him right into the current day? Uh, no, actually, I kind of developed his... Um, I've been developing his backstory since the, again, I publish these as serials on my blog. I've got kind of, I've been doing Vela before Kindle <laughs> ever did. Okay. And so um, since these are romances with espionage intrusion, it's all about the characters and Nick shows up in book four of the series. Uh, he is my main character, Sid's son that he didn't know about. <laughs> Sid sleeps around, I slept around a lot. <laughs> and it's one of the reasons I kept the series in when I went to do the rewrites, it's one of the reasons I kept it in the 1980s because Sid couldn't exist now. <laughs> so um, when that all started to happen, uh, then I kind of got to a little family business, which is right after Sid gives up sleeping around to be with Lisa, the other major character, who, by the way, is the narrator. Oh, one other fun thing. I got to warn everybody. The Aberration Quickline series, it is cozy. It's nice. Lisa doesn't swear. 
Okay. Sid peels paints off the walls, but Lisa <laughs> does not swear. So, you know, I'm dropping F bombs all over the place in my normal life, but, you know, Lisa doesn't swear. She's nice. So, anyway, um, so as the series developed, uh, the one I'm blogging now, which is, you know, a little family business, well, Sid and Lisa have to take custody of Nick. And uh, Sid's voice has been a point through all this whole damn series. He interjects all the time. And he's, Lisa's writing from the immediacy of the events. Sid is writing from years later. And so when I got to the little family business and was doing the rewrite on, I realized I didn't need to hear his voice. How do I do that? Well, he starts writing letters to Brianna. It becomes obvious if it, if it will become obvious in a few books down the road that Brianna is his wife or his eventual wife. But in the little family business, oh, she's some sort of girlfriend. Okay, fine. So that's kind of how, and it just kind of evolved from there. I knew where Nick's cousin, Lisa's nephew slash Nick's best friend, Darby, was coming from i knew where all these characters were coming from i even know how sid and lisa died so it's just it's a few years yet i don't know if that's going to come but it's just, i've been living with these characters for 30 years yeah. okay <laughs> no 40 years <laughs> you know so it they kind of it just kind of happened and so when I came to the point where these, I, I wanted to tell some more stories, but I wanted to tell them from a very different perspective, that's how it did. And so I don't know if that makes sense, but then I don't know if I, I I'm trying to remember, did I write this specifically for Jack? I think I may have, but I just, it was just, okay, this is a good story. And it got weird because Nick's a biochemist and he's, you know, a little more cynical. There's that one line, Brianna would say, I worry about everything. Well, yeah, he does. He's a worry ward. And, and all these other things that had come out of all the stuff I was working on earlier. And, and I basically did most of the rewrites on the series during the pandemic. I kind of went under and my husband is so sick of the search. You do not <laughs> want to know. <laughs> Uh, at least you had plenty of time to, to work on it. Uh, all right. Uh, and next up is going to be Andrew uh, with a story that is depressingly set in what is considered a historical time period <laughs> nowadays, I think, in 1981. Uh, and <laughs> let's see if uh, we learn about the samurai culture from all the research that you did. So it was not wasted research. <laughs> oh, no. Here we go again. Oh, is he mean? Is he? Can we hear you? No, he's, he's, he's silent again. Not he, frozen, he froze but we can't hear him. Oh, I heard a grunt. He may be on. I, I think I'm back now. There he I'm is. I'm yeah. saying I have uh, an unstable connection. I uh, Sorry about that. That was perfect timing. Um, <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yep. I'm hearing you, dear. OK. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to start the story. If it cuts out again, I will gladly start again. All right. We'll just, we'll just wave or flail our arms if it cuts okay. out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is Samurai 81, the opening scene. I sat at my desk in the glass house across from my new partner, Junichiro Jun Genji. We closed our first homicide together this afternoon, an open and shut and I was finishing the paperwork when a fresh call for us arrived, hand-delivered by Captain Carnahan. That winter, I was 32, the youngest detective ever promoted to the robbery homicide division. A series of high-profile cases quickly pushed me up the ladder. Ford Newcomen, the COO of Goldmart, just got murdered in the parking lot of Yamashiro. Yamashiro was a swank Japanese restaurant in the hills. Captain Carnahan handed a yellow sheet with all the information to June, the senior detective. The assistant chief's monitoring this personally, the captain said. Newcomen had high up friends and there's irregularities. Witnesses said the killer used a samurai sword. 
a samurai sword? At first, I thought this might be a joke because June and I are both Japanese, or maybe a hazing ritual because I was new to the division. An old partner in West Bureau Homicide once told me about how he saw a guy who'd gotten his pinky cut off at a Yakuza bar in Little Tokyo. But even that was years ago. It was 1981 now. People weren't killed with samurai swords anymore. Nice. Thank you. Uh, so this story uh, continues on and takes us uh, to Hawaii. Uh, and I want to know, did okay. you uh, do the research that you're talking about and, and were you able to parlay that into maybe writing off a trip to Hawaii on your taxes? <laughs> I, I, I've been to Hawaii. It wasn't for this particular trip. I, uh, I love, I'm a big uh, From Here to Eternity fan. Just watched mm -hmm. that movie a few times and just kind of knew I wanted to write a story that had a location there and I had been there once. Um, I have been to the restaurant where the murder happens. If you guys have been there or not, I don't know, it's pretty cool. But um, also, um, yeah, you know, you, you guys know, of course. Um, and the area where the Samurai's train much later in the story, it was a, an Airbnb in Beachwood Canyon that my girlfriend and I stayed in, which is directly across the street from Barbara Stanwyck's house in Double Indemnity, which still oh. looks pretty close to yeah. what it looked like during the war. And so during this one trip, we stayed in that house. We went to Yamashiro and it was just like, I had to write something in these two locations. They were both so cool. You know? Wow, you get, guys, I, just, I feel bad. I just make shit up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> It's also no, it's an incentive do, to dear. do cool things, you know. It's an incentive to go someplace that I may not schlep my way all the way up to the hills, but for a story, that's something that uh, you know, I'll definitely do it for that. Yeah, absolutely. And they're right, still well, open. I just checked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Well, Matt Witten, uh, you. It, I hope this is not an insult, but you are not the first person that I picture when I think about the uh, social media platform TikTok. <laughs> uh, I, I have a 15 and 16 year old daughter, which is kind of the only way I know what this is as a man over 50. So uh, before we even get to your story, how did you choose to set a story in this world of uh, millionaire influencers? Well, you know, I think it's interesting that uh, teenage kids and, you know, like they want to be TikTok famous, you know, they want to be TikTok stars you know, in the same way that uh, people used to want to be movie stars, mm -hmm. you know, now this is, this is the dream. Uh, and I think it's, uh, I think it's interesting. Um, I just think that's an interesting phenomenon. I I've been thinking about it. Sometimes I think that our society has, um, that, that, that kids now feel it's a little bit less likely that they can just have a good solid middle-class life that they can, um, you know, do the normal things, take a normal path. I mean, I'm using the word normal, maybe that's the wrong word, but do a traditional path and, you know, work up the ladder and become, you know, a teacher or, or some doctor or, or whatever, a factory, something that's a middle-class life. And I, sometimes I think maybe they despair about that and they just like, I gotta be famous, you know, I gotta be, I gotta do something really special. And so sometimes I think that's a change in our society that kids are a little bit more, uh, I was going to use the word desperate. I don't know if that's the right word, but a little bit more concerned. And then sometimes I think, no, nothing has changed. Of course they want to be famous. It's fun to be famous. Kids used to want to be movie stars, like I was saying, and they want it now. So I, I guess I find that interesting. But in terms of like my writing it as a guy uh, over 50, I mean, one of the most fun things about writing it, the, you know, like the little piece I'll read to you today is, is, is in a, you know, the voice of an 18 year old girl was just, you know, emailing all my nieces and nephews to find out what the right slang was, you know, is it appropriate to use the word bay or is that outdated, you mm -hmm. know, uh, how does one use the word yes, you know, um, the word fire. And just all this stuff. And then, and then um, so I would have email chains where I would ask all my nie 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 nieces and nephews and my sons and my daughters-in-law who are young enough barely to know some of the slang. I mean, some of them are getting a little up there and they can't do it anymore. But just, it was just a way to connect everybody in my family, you know, with this stuff. 
Then my sister, teach, my sister, my wife teaches at Crossroads a uh, 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 school at Santa Monica. And so mm -hmm. she would ask her kids, is this appropriate, you know, slang for someone? So anyway, so I wrote it and then, you know, turned it into Jacked and, and Vern uh, Smith was editing it. And my memory is that he sent me an email while he was editing it, editing it said, oh, my 16 year old son, or maybe it was his nephew, I think it was his son, just told me that you wouldn't really use this language, you would use this. So, um, you know, it, it was fun learning all about it. You know, I, I, I really enjoyed it. And, and um, so, yeah, I, I know what you're saying about like not doing research and sometimes I don't and I just like to make stuff up, but you know, this was a fun kind of research to do. All right, well, let's, uh, let's hear from one of these many points of view. Okay, so this is like I say, it's the beginning of the short story and it's this 18 year old girl named Carolyn is her name. Looking in my closet, I'm thinking, I could totally pull off this red blazer for preppy vibes, but my fans would never be into it. How about going Lux Punk with this slinky fishneck and the bat black boots? That could get me another half million hits. But then I see the tie dye hoodie and think, what if I put that together with the black crop top? Glam plus grit. Oh yeah, that is for sure it. The parents are out of town, so I'm staying out all night long. I figure, First, I'll go to Jeremy's birthday party for a minute. He'd kill me if I don't make it. Then I got a sweet gig at this new Hollywood club, The Blind Spot. I get 3,000 bucks just to show up and dance with the B-listers. I'm not mad about it. it. Wasn't always like this. Just six months ago, I'm studying for the SATs at Starbucks with my girl Gwen. Total nerd, like me. I don't even drink coffee. Not a fan of the taste. But then this V cute guy at the next table, he's like 25, Jeremy, a big TikTok talent manager, only I don't know it right then. And he likes my retro 2000 out, 2000s outfit. So he puts me up on his Insta stories and suddenly, boom, 200,000 new followers. So we start making videos. Last week, he shot me finding disco pants at Goodwill and we got 20 million hits. My third time over 10 mil just turned 18 and I'm practically in the hype house. <laughs> Matt, I got to tell you, my nephew actually does in real life represent social media people. Oh, wow. And I've been listening to him talk, tell us about it. Uh, this is just cracking me up because it, you, yeah, you nailed it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next story I write like this, I'll call him for help too. <laughs> May as well. Liam's a doll. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm curious when you go, we're all novelists uh, in, in addition to the other stuff that, that we all write. I want to know when you take on a short story, do you try hard to make sure that it fits your style and that it's something that readers is, are going to get something that they expect if they already know your work? Or do you use a short story as a chance to maybe break the mold a little bit and experiment? Andrew? It's really kind of a combination of both. I always want to experiment, but also at the same time, this story references. Oh dear, here we go again, Andrew. We were hearing you, but you were frozen and then you unfrozen, we can't hear you. See, this is where we need the teenagers to figure out how to work this this damn no, internet we box. Okay, I think I'm back now. Connection. Sorry, I don't have a means to do maintenance on this right now. I'm really sorry about this. Um, Just like smack it on the side. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, it's a little bit of both. I'm not sure how much of my answer came through. I um I always try to experiment and do something that's a little unknown, but um. You know, the characters in my story, they, you know, they skirt of Samurai 81, they kind of skirt the law a little bit, but I did another, they're, I see them as ultimately heroic, um, but I did a story earlier called uh, Shootout at Namaste Mart in Broadswords and Blasters mm. that dealt with uh, some very, very corrupt LAPD officers that were sort of envisioning themselves as samurai. And I sort of perceived this story as, these are the guys that those guys got the idea from. That story was set in 2019. This one is set in, uh, you know, in 1981. And so I don't think a lot of people reading Jacked 
are going to remember that connection. But as things go on, I want people to sort of see like, oh, there's a little tie into this other story. and Everything kind of fits into the same world a little bit. Yeah. Matt, you've, you've got, uh, you know, some novels and, and you've done recurring characters before. Is this uh, something that you see a short story as a way to, to flex different muscles? Um, I guess so, yeah. Uh, you know, Anne was saying something before about cuss words. You know, one challenge I set to myself in this uh, short story was not to use any cuss words. Uh, <laughs> so I found that very interesting. I, I don't know why I wanted to try it, but I just did. And I was surprised that I was able to do it because uh, I'm so used to using them, you know, in my other work. Um, you know, even in TV, I've written, you know, more for cable lately. So, um, uh, yeah, so I enjoy doing that. And, um, I, you know, I feel like everything I write, like, is a little bit kind of different from, you know, stuff before, whether it's a short story or a novel. You know, sometimes I feel really envious of writers who just have this lane that works so well. Like, I've read every Michael Connolly book he's ever written, literally. And he just got this down. He knows what he's doing and he's doing it. And, and it's great. And I kind of wish I was like that. Really what I do with my writing is every book that I write, it, I mean, they're all crime books, but you know, everything from cozy to hard boiled, you know, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that, a thriller or more traditional mystery or this or that. And um, you know, for whatever reason, that's the way I've just constructed. And I, I guess I have to uh, accept it that, that, um, you know, I'm this old, I'm probably never going to find the thing that I'm going to you know, stick with all the time. So um, I, you know, that's just the way it is for me. And I mean, we already covered a little bit. I mean, this is, it's, it's in the world that you've already created, but a little, a little bit different tone. Oh yeah, very much so. And, and the weird thing is, it's kind of like what Matt was saying. And Matt, I am so with you on this one because I am about as eclectic as hell. I have written fantasies. I've written, uh, I've got a time travel epic. Sorry, that was Ben's a dream, a cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I, you know, I, you know, this idea that, well, hell, I don't read only one genre. Why in heaven's name would you expect me to write on only one genre? Yeah. Uh, I've got another book that's kind of in the reviewing. I finished the first draft of it earlier this year. I'm letting it simmer, but it's a goddamn tech thriller. <laughs> I mean, you know. And yeah, okay, I'm a closet geek, I'll admit that. But, um, you know, I, if I can get my friends to actually start reading the damn thing, I'd find out if I got my tech right. <laughs> but it's just, I write the stories that present themselves. I, and, and it's like I said earlier, I'm a very audio writer. When the people start talking to me, damn it, I'm there. And I don't know what else to do. Um, do I drop F-bombs in the Rage Issues, which is a PI story, and the occasional F-bomb in the time travel? Yeah. Uh, they're all over the place in Running Way to Boston, which is going to come out for another year or so, just that's okay. But I also write a nice Victorian lady in the old Los Angeles series, which is set in the 1870s. And I'm sorry, Manny doesn't even acknowledge sex exists, but barely <laughs> acknowledges sex exists. She's a Victorian woman. You don't do that. Right. So, you know, it's just, I don't know. These are the stories that come up. Yeah, does, you, you, you got to follow it where it leads, right? I mean, really, you absolutely yeah. have to. And, you know, does Nick swear? Yeah, he does. His daddy peels paint off of walls. And, you know, his mom's probably gone back on the whole I don't swear thing by this point. But, you know, it's it's just who these characters are and how they've evolved. And and by the way, Andrew, uh, the Quickline series was originally written in the 1980s, 1982 <laughs> to begin with. <sighs> I had to keep it there because of Sid, but it's just... I don't like calling them historical either. I, know, I really, the worst. really don't like worst. calling them historical. I know. 
it's it is interesting. You know, I've I always struggle with this. You know, I write. I've written a couple of trilogies. I, I write mostly standalones, and it, I've kind of played tricks on myself in, in order to not repeat the same, you know, rhythm and the same pace to to different stories. And and I, I wrote in my novel uh, all the way down. I like you were saying, Matt. I, I sort of set up a challenge for myself, and I wrote that whole novel with no speech tags. There's no he said, she said. It's all you know implied in the room you know someone gets up and crosses someone moves a paper it's it was an interesting exercise and I think it did sort of just inherently change up the rhythm a little bit even if my language is still me it still sounds like me uh and the most surprising thing is that I no one ever mentioned it I don't know if that I don't know that anyone ever noticed (laughs) but but it was a good exercise for myself in in breaking my own habits and having it read a little differently so is Eric, that, that's read, the fun of writing. Eric, are you going to read us a little half page of your uh, short story? Yeah, no, people, no, no, no. People got to buy the book. To, that's, <laughs> yeah, buy the book. It's it's no right over here. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there's so many great there stories in here. We, we want I, and I, I don't want to take up too much, uh, too much time. We, we only got a, a little bit to go here. But um, I, I do want to, you know, since this is a little bit of a, of a get to know you, I've, I've met at least two of you just sort of out at events, but I want to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, Andrew, you're, you're a transplant uh, to Los Angeles from, from yes. the Midwest, but you've been here a while. And then, as we know, this story was set in Los Angeles, and it sounds like you do a lot of writing about Los Angeles. Is that where you prefer to, to set your stories now that you live here? Almost always. There's a few exceptions, but... Um... The movie L.A. Confidential and then the novels of James Elroy that I discovered when I was in seventh grade, it was sort of like I could sort of tell you a little bit about how to get around L.A. even though I had never been there. Um, I never really knew that I was going to move here as a child that just sort of I never knew why or when it was going to happen, but it just sort of happened. And I knew that it was always going to happen, something that was always kind of an instinct. And yeah, I just, I really, I really like it. I really love it here. And it's just always a setting that really comes naturally. And it's always, there's always something interesting that would fit into a story. Just that there's always something that I can always find. I've never put a story in Pasadena, I live in Pasadena now, and I'm excited to do that <laughs> at some point. But um, yeah, is, yeah, I just, uh, I pretty much always set it here. Is there any temptation to reach back into your past and set something in Ohio? I definitely considered it at some point and my story my novella Lady Tomahawk which was in uh, LA stories which I saw you uh you had a story in a switchblade one Scotch Rutherford the guy that yeah, yeah. No, I had a couple one yeah one of the other guys um that had a had an anthology in there the background of some of the characters is sort of inspired by some of my background and so there's definitely some people that came from Ohio to LA but it's just, you know, when I go, when I go home to Ohio, it's, I appreciate it more than I ever did growing up. It's nice finding a parking space. It's nice, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, seeing how quiet everything is, but it's just after a week towards the end of a, a week of staying there, it's just, it's just not interesting to me, not compared to LA. It just, it just really isn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, Anne, I, I was curious about uh, the line in your bio that uh, you used to be a TV critic, which, uh, which it scares me. me. Well, it scares me because I, I fear that you may have reviewed some shows that I've worked on and maybe not been too favorable. <laughs> Who knows? I don't remember. Uh, I mostly focused on family television for, because it was a niche thing. Mm. But um, yeah, I did... 15 plus years did the TCA press conference. Shit. Eric, was that where we met each other? The TCA no, I, press I, tour? No, I've never actually been to TCA. Oh, okay. I've, it's I've the sent, television sent shows Critics there. Association press tour. It is basically a, uh, as one of my friends put it, the Bataan Death March with cocktail parties. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's basically the network dog and pony show. Yeah, Matt, you've done TV, so you may have heard of it. Again, the whole joke with screenwriters in LA, let's be real. You hear about the starlet who was so dumb she tried to sleep her way to the top with the screenwriter. 
<laughs> and yeah, that's kind of the attitude, which always <laughs> sucks. But you know, so yeah, I did fifty. I gave it up in twenty fourteen. I was burnt to a crisp. Yeah. I mean, you could smell the smoke wafting off of me <laughs> after this. It was bad. Um, but yeah, and I, that's when I decided to really start focusing on my fiction career because it was something I'd always wanted to do. And nice. that's what I did. And Matt, you have uh, extensive screenwriting experience. Uh, and I, I'm always curious when I talk to screenwriters who sort of play both sides of the fence, because <laughs> screenwriting can be very rigid in what's expected you know it's it's very much about the three act structure and exactly where those act breaks fall and it you know needs to be on this page some people will tell you and and so there's a little bit it can get a little dogmatic in that way but I, do you find that you like the freedom of that a novel opens up for you or do you also have these habits that are so ingrained you sort of naturally fall back into those rhythms um yeah uh i really like the freedom that uh, that novel writing can give you or short story writing can give you uh the freedom to um you know give the characters internal uh monologue or internal life uh you get a little bit more freedom in novels and you get a little bit more freedom also in uh, giving their backstory which is similar so you can you know have a little bit more character depth uh you know i would say in general that like, I feel like TV and movies have gotten better at that. You know, they've gotten better, like, at incorporating flashbacks into things and just using all kinds of different um, methods, gadgets, or I, I'm not sure the right word, conventions, but to, but to give the character to, to be able to s see what's inside his internal, you know, mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the traditional thing is that uh, novels are, are, are best at showing, uh, you know, internal conflict, and TV is best at showing uh, interpersonal conflict, uh, and movies are also good at interpersonal and are also good often at, at societal conflict. They can have a big wide canvas. Um, so I, I appreciate, I appreciate the freedom of being able to get a little deeper with the character, and, and I will say that that, like when I uh, see a novel uh, and a movie. A, a movie based on the novel. Um, I always liked the novel better uh, mm -hmm. with one exception, which was The Natural. Um, <laughs> and I always liked the novel better. And I think novels, uh, you know, they can just go a little deeper. So yeah, I appreciate that freedom in terms of feeling like I have to, you know, rigidly adhere to structure. Um, you know, I'm more experienced at TV writing than not screenwriting, uh, movie writing. TV writing is extremely structural, obviously. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, I like I like the freedom, but I also I feel like all the years of TV writing have taught me, you know, tightness and also structure and the importance of of just never having that that I leave the screen, you know, because mm -hmm. if you're writing and I've also written plays, if you're writing TV or plays, people can't skim. You know, they can't skim. I can read a book. I've read, I read a book recently. I won't name it, but it was 650 words long. I pro pages. I probably skimmed 300 of those pages and I still found the reading of it to be a good experience. I couldn't do that for a TV show. TV right. show, you just can't. And like, I watch so many TV shows, you know, I might be on my phone while I do it, but so... I think my novels and my short stories probably tend to have less things that people skim probably because of my TV training. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think that I'm a little bit more structurally focused. So even though I do have the freedom now, I try not to, I don't think I overuse it or whatever. I think I still <laughs> try to, you know, adhere pretty much to, you know, a concept of structure that keeps the plot moving. Yeah. Well, that's good. 
All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, for joining me. It's and it's again, it's an honor to be uh, in jacked with you all. And I think this is it was such a great opportunity for me to meet a ton of new writers that I had not known before. Some people that I, I really piqued my interest, and I want to see what comes next from them. I think that's one of the beauties of an anthology like this is, you know, you get to sample a little bit of different styles, different voices, uh, you know, people that are new, people who are old favorites. And I think I get, this is a perfect example of some of the great and most interesting stuff that's coming on the indie presses that are out there these days. Uh, so I, I wanna thank the team at Run Amok for putting this together. And, uh, and I hope that everyone who's uh, watching here is interested in the book and uh, there's really, it's worth your time. Uh, so I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us, and I'm sure I will run into all three of you uh, out and about around yeah. LA. If, yeah, if and Matt, thank you for putting up the nose to the Mystery Writers of America. I saw that, and thank you for that, because I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look for this one uh, next award season. It's going to be all over the uh, the award ballots, right? Oh, I with from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Yeah, it's Excellent. cool. It really does have a great variety. I really did enjoy it. It really event. does. Sure. And, and that is the one thing I've read on all the reviews is that there's just so much diversity in style and everything else. And um, it's, you know, it's almost like Los Angeles. We're <laughs> such a diverse region. We have so many people here who are different. And, you know, Andrew, you want to talk history? My husband's an archivist, okay? Oh, awesome. <laughs> We've got some talking <laughs> to be <laughs> hard. <laughs> and, you know, so it's just, you want to do history? Let me know. But it's, it's this whole idea that there's so much here in LA, but there's so much everywhere else too. Yeah. And, and, for that, I am profoundly grateful. And I am, like I said, immensely honored that I have been included among you gentlemen. So. All right. Well, we uh, hope everyone checks out Jacked and uh, thanks for tuning in. Thank bye -bye. you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Bye -bye. Great thanks to see you.